talking about issues that matter to IASA, to our exec, and to our broader community. Um, and so this, um, this event, I, I'm really, really pleased to be welcoming three speakers who know an awful lot about um, the, the debates, the, the, the contestations, the practicalities, the politics, of, um, of open access and putting that into a, into a global context. And so um, our title today is Global Trajectories of Open Access. And um, obviously many of you will know that um, IASA's journal, Social Anthropology, Anthropology Sociale, um, is, has, you, you have helped us flip it and um, it'll be published by um, Burkhan in a sustainable to open model um, from the start of next year. So that's a sort of an excuse really to, to really open up this much bigger question to understand the history of the open access movement because of course it is a both a political movement with very strong advocates uh, who've achieved a great deal and it has become a, a highly profitable business for publishers who have found a way of um of, of especially the big um big publishers who have found a way to do big deals as they call them with them um, with nation states and um and capitalized on what they call an apc model an author pays um, model so so this is a really complicated difficult um messy scene um because um it really varies by discipline it depends on disciplinary cultures it depends on the histories of journals and their and their credibilities and the ways in which they sustain their reputation uh, it, there aren't easy answers to this i think that's that's really important to acknowledge and um, what works for one discipline doesn't work for another. What might work for Europe might not work for Nigeria or um, um, other parts of the world where we have much less, um, much less well-resourced infrastructures. So I think in some ways what I hope we get out of today is we move from a debate about open access, good or bad, move beyond that to open access for whom, by whom, and at what cost, but then even beyond that further to, to the focus on the infrastructures that enable these debates to happen. What is it we need for open access debates to for, for an open access provision to, um, to to not simply reinforce existing hierarchies and trajectories, but to enable researchers to share knowledge um, across global circuits? Um, we haven't got we haven't got the answers, but I hope we've got three great presenters who are going to um, help us ask these questions. We're going to do a bit of tracing back to the history of um, open access, and um, you know, many of you anthropologists will know that. Um, Keith Hart and others, you know, were, were very interested in the Open Access Collective in the 1990s, and many humanities scholars sort of began to think about how you might use the internet in the 1990s to um, open up, open up scholarship. Um, and so we're going to trace back from there, and then going forward to think about how it's changed over 20 years and how the debates have moved on. Um, and as I say, you know, thinking about what what what's a community controlled approach to open access might look like, and and the future of digital scholarship in this space. So we've got three speakers. I'm going to say a little bit about each one before I invite Marcel to start. So Marcel Laflamme is, um, um, knows a lot about anthropology. Um, he can tell us a bit more about it, but he, he's currently Open Research Manager at um, PLOS, which is Public Library of Science. Um, trained both as a librarian and anthropologist. He was Managing Editor of Cultural Anthropology, 2015-2019, and sits on Libraria, which many of you might have come across, which is a, a lobby group within anthropology. Um, pushing for a more diverse community controlled ecosystem. Vivian will need no introduction. Um, Burkhan Publishers have been um, really good friends of anthropology for many, many years, publishing books and um, journals. And she um, is currently managing director and journals editorial director. Um, she um, serves on the ALSPS Council, has previously worked for a number of other publishers, and is completing her PhD in anthropology at um, CUNY in New York. And finally, Angela. Uh, Kune is Associate Editor for the Open Access Journal Engaging Science, Technology and Society. And as part of her um, PhD, she was doing some really interesting experimental work um, thinking about non-extractive models to ethnographic research um, and building scholarly community, um, doing research in Nairobi on the tech community there. So she'll tell us more about her work and her interesting open source platform, which is called Platform for Experimental Collaborative Ethnography. Um, I've said enough. It's 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 time to hand over to Marcel. Marcel, the um the podium is all yours. And thank you very much, all of us as presenters. I'm recognising that all of you got up early this morning. Embarrassingly, all of us um are listening into three presenters from the US. But um, but the, the, I'm really pleased to have them all. So thank you very much for getting up. That's great. Thanks, David. Can, can you hear me? Okay. 
Great. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for for the opportunity to to be here and and um, yeah, I mean my my congratulations really to 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 Yasa for for being at this moment sort of on the on the cusp of an open access transition um, that I know has been um, you know a long time in the in the planning and and the, the sketching out and how to do that in a, in a responsible way for the society. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, as the first speaker today, I'll 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 try to set the scene a little bit, and then I I, I know um, yeah I'm, I'm be excited to hear from from Vivian and from Angela as well. Um, I'll just preface this by saying that I, I am speaking today in a personal capacity, so not on behalf of PLOS. Um, although I'll I'll draw on some examples from PLOS's own kind of global trajectories as, as I'm sort of um, getting to, to understand them better myself. So I thought I'd start um, less with the with the history than in a sense with a snapshot of the present, right? And to ask the question, what does open access anthropology look like in 2021? Um, so, you know, I, I've just gathered, well, I've gathered four articles here sort of published uh, this year, all in, in the field of anthropology. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about, about um, each article and, and, and its, its source. Um, so on, on the left hand side there you have, um, I looked at the, the oldest and then the youngest uh, journal uh, anthropology title in, as indexed in the directory of open access journals. Um, so at the top um, you have MANA, um, which is a, a Brazilian social anthropology journal. Um, based at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So, you know, interesting to know, this is the, the, uh, the anthropology journal that has been in the directory of open access journals the longest. Um, the title was founded in the mid nineties. It was, it was indexed in 2004. Um, and it's published at Cielo, um, which is a publicly funded digital infrastructure based in Latin America. Um, as you can see there, the, the title appears in Portuguese. The journal also publishes in Spanish. Um, yeah, it's, it's funded by national research agencies um, in Brazil, which are currently jeopardized by the, the latest round of funding cuts by the Bolsonaro um, administration. So the, the next one down, so the, the lower left there um, is a, an Indonesian anthropology journal. So um, based at Hassanuddin University there. Um, so this journal is published on open journal systems, um, which is, as many of you know, an open source journal management system um, and one of, if not the most widely uh, used piece of, of journal software in the world. Um, so, so this is one of, of 25,000 instances of OJS around the world um, that, that is run by the, the university library there. Um, the journal does principally publish in English, so that's an interesting um, contrast between the, the um, mana above it. Um, and it is an APC or, or article processing charge based journal. Um, so for grant funded research, the APC is about 90 euros. Um, and uh, research that is not grant funded or, or submitted by graduate students is sort of eligible for, for waivers. So just interesting there to take a little sample of, of sort of either end of the, the DOAJ spectrum and to see sort of what's being published. Um, on the upper right, you have a, an article uh, published in Nature Human Behavior. Um, and and um, this one I, I chose um, because it, it is the highest APC that I know of. Um, so uh, it costs 9,500 euros to publish this article. Um, and the journal, of course, is, is published by, by Springer Nature, one of the, the so-called big five commercial publishers, um, you know, arguably the most sophisticated publishing platform uh, that, that, that appears here um, in terms of certain kinds of, of metrics and sort of integrations with other, with other services. Um, it's important to note that, that um, this uh, of our four here is the only hybrid journal, or, or they refer to it as a transformational journal. Um, so not everything that appears in Nature Human Behavior is available open access, um, but if you pay an APC, then, then it can be. Um, and then the last one, roadsides may be familiar to, to some, you know, some folks here at, at IASA. Um, you know, really, I think a different end of the, of the open access um, spectrum in some ways. So, so it's a scholar-led journal um, led by a team of 11 researchers in Europe and the US. Um, they publish on their own WordPress site. 
Um, they publish only in PDF, and it, you can see the article that I've, I've kind of selected here on the right. Um, they're actually sort of playable audio clips embedded in the article and hosted on their on their site. Um, so this is you know another no APC journal. Um, and roadsides, you know, I, I know some of the folks involved have really kind of pieced together support from some national funders, authors, institutions, um, yeah, have been quite creative about sort of um, resourcing the, the journal at the small scale that it, that it happens at. So I give us this rundown just to, to kind of give us a sense of the diversity of what is published under the sign of open access in anthropology. And I could keep going, right? So we could talk about journals that have flipped, um, like my previous employer, Cultural Anthropology. Um, we could talk about funder platforms like Open Research Europe, um, which was which was launched earlier this year. Um, Preprints or, or authors' versions that are deposited in repositories, um, so that the the version of record is behind a paywall, but the authors' version is freely available. We could talk about pirate sites like SciHub. Um, so, you know, all of these knowledge objects, I guess I want to emphasize, are in some sense open, um, but they are entangled in different institutional arrangements and they encode different commitments, um, some of which we might normatively prefer to others, right? So that's kind of the starting point that I want to give us. And here, you know, <laughs> sort of say possibly obvious points of departure, I think these are really... Um, yeah, are, are, are things that it's important to make explicit um, as we sort of try to, 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 to think about how to position ourselves with respect to open access. So there's a, a tweet here by, by a, a colleague, Sam Moore, who's based in the UK. Um, right, so, so the idea that folks who work on open access to research have a variety of commitments, but they agree on one thing, right? And that's open access to research. And I mean, that that's a tautology, but I also think it's worth um, yeah, it, it's worth really identifying that as a least common denominator and the fact that people who care about open access can disagree about many, many other things. I think that's a, an important um, takeaway. So, yeah, I would argue that open access solves a particular set of problems around the availability of research literature. Um, often those are talked about in terms of cost and in terms of permissions. Um, but to be clear, open access doesn't solve and has never claimed to solve all problems around the availability of research literature. It doesn't, for instance, guarantee everyone access to the internet. Um, the second point sort of about, you know, the way in which open access creates another set of problems, right? It may solve one, you know, solve one set of problems and create another set. And I think that's something that, that we can probably talk about more um, later. I think there's a, there's a growing awareness of this point. And so I, I, I maybe won't say as much about it. The third point, like if there's a thesis for, for my sort of, you know, piece of, of what I'm, I'm contributing today, it's, it's this. That I would argue that open access leaves some set of problems in scholarly communication unaddressed, right? It may reflect them, it may even perpetuate them by not working to actively transform them, but doesn't create those problems. And I, I would argue that that's a distinction worth preserving, especially as David said, if we want to move beyond a kind of open access, good or bad um, framing. Um, and I actually want to make the case for what I've called here. Let's see, I'm just having a bit of trouble advancing the slide. Um, I'm not sure if one of the presenters can help with that. Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, Sorry, folks. So let's see, can we go uh, one and then what? <laughs> let's see. So I'll stop clicking and if someone could just advance one slide from there, that would be great. Sorry about that. Perfect, right. So what I've called here a, a deflationary view of open, right? And um, I think there's one strand of thinking that says, you know, Let's, let's extend the purview of what it means for scholarship to be truly open, right? Let's sort of layer things on top of this basic definition about availability with respect to, to cost and permissions. So let's talk about sustainable business models. Let's talk about, um, yeah, sort of how knowledge is acquired. Um, and yeah, I guess here I, I wanna make the case maybe a little provocatively for a, a, a kind of deflationary view of, of open that really starts from this kind of 
um, definition that was codified just about 20 years ago now at the, the Budapest Open Access Initiative um, that really emphasizes free and I would maybe add durable. I think they, they maybe didn't have that on their horizon uh, then in the same way that we might now, um, but that it's really about this sort of free availability uh, and about, about reuse um, in, in various ways. And again, I mean, that, that Budapest moment, I think it's important to, to note that really the scope that they had in mind were journal articles, right? So now as we start to talk about open monographs, open textbooks or educational resources, I mean, I would argue that the initial expression of what scholarly communication was going to look like at that moment in 2001 um, was in some ways a quite conservative one, right? That assumed that we would continue to have journals and that the question was going to be how to sort of um, regulate and administer access to them. Um, and, you know, today, certainly at, at PLOS, I, I think, you know, and in other corners of scholarly communication, there are questions about, you know, what comes after the journal, right? And, and is the journal the sort of um, unit of analysis that we sort of expect to be, to be working with indefinitely? Um, so let's see, could we go forward two slides from here? Great, thank you. Um, so you know, this is sort of the, the conceit of my title that I'll, I'll, I'll kind of share here is, is this idea of open as and open and is a way that I've sort of started to think about how to sort of tease these things apart. Um, and, and I think there's, there's thinking on open access in anthropology and adjacent fields that I admire and that I, I have found really productive to engage with that I would put in the sort of open as strand, right? So thinking about co-production, right? So how does openness um, in its various guises sort of structurally, how is it linked to sort of different um, effects? How, how might it affect new closures? Um, there's a, a great piece by Anand and I'll, I'll drop it in the chat later um, that he wrote a, a couple of years ago about how you know, open access isn't enough. We need openness in so many other sort of registers as well. Um, and so this intensification of openness is actually what anthropology needs. On the other hand, there's this idea of, of you know, the, the sort of exhaustedness of open as this kind of master signifier that it's just an empty buzzword and, and you know, there, there's just no sort of critical traction that it gives anymore. And, you know, I, I guess what I want to propose, not instead, but alongside those, those framings, is this idea of open and, right, of, of articulation. And, and I, I'm kind of taking Stuart Hall's sort of understanding of that here. Um, so, you know, openness as, as a limited good, right, but one that, that can be coupled with other commitments that need to be specified um, and, and that, you know, in specifying them, as I'll talk about a bit later, um, you know, different kinds of coalitions can come into to focus, um, and and yeah, we, we can sort of get clear on beyond thinking that free access to articles is a good thing, right? We can sort of understand how our values do and don't line up with different um, coalitions of actors. So from there, I have one sort of last section. Um, could we go forward? Sorry, um, uh, uh, three slides here, I guess now. Yep, great. So just, yeah, the, the last piece I'll, I'll just speak about um, has to do with, with PLOS, so with my, my current employer. And, you know, with, with a moment at which I joined this organization where kind of global engagement and, and you know, relating to these global trajectories that we're talking about as the, the umbrella for this, for this session, um, you know, it, it was a moment where this, this you know, this publisher based in the Anglophone Global North, so with offices in the U.S. and the U.K., um, was really seeking to diversify its hiring, its editorial boards, its published articles, kind of in the in the key of the global, right? So from the the job announcement that I applied for through my onboarding, like there, there's a, there's a lot of talk about global at Plots right now. Um, and, and I think that this sort of open and kind of articulation approach has been helpful for me in trying to understand this from the inside um, by paying attention to the articulations that are being proposed um, and, and by, yeah, sort of looking at some contradictions or interference effects that, that might arise from them. Um, and I think this is significant because, you know, as we're thinking about what's next for open access, um, you know, PLOS is certainly a place that, that likes to think uh, in those terms. 
Um, and, and, you know, PLOS's mega journal, PLOS One, was at one point the biggest journal in the world, um, you know, publishing north of, of 30,000 articles a year. So it's also about what open access looks like at scale, right? And, and um, not that open access always has to be at scale, but certainly there's a, there's a, a view of that. Um, yeah, I think it's important to, to, to recall that PLOS was founded as an open access publisher, right? So in 2001, um, PLOS kind of emerged on the scene as a life sciences publisher principally, um, but yeah, sort of 100% open access from, from the beginning. Um, Mike Eisen, who was one of the, the three co-founders, was himself a, a signatory of the Budapest Open Access Initiative. So I'll just talk about, oh dear, okay. Um, so can we go forward? Uh, yeah, thank you. So I'll just talk about these two kind of global engagements and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, so, you know, one area that PLOS is, is thinking, I, I guess in these global terms is around new business models. Um, I, I think with Vivian's presentation, we'll hear a bit more about subscribe to open, um, but I'll, I'll just touch briefly on these two business models um, that, that PLOS has been developing. Um, and, you know, PLOS is really a publisher that, that grew up around the APC, right? That, that the APC is really what has sort of kept the lights on and has been the kind of lifeblood of, of, the, of the organization. And so moving beyond the APC, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that there's two parts to that. And one is, is strategic and is just a sense that in the marketplace, um, yeah, that, that, that funders and institutions are, are ready to start having conversations about what happens. Um, yeah, the way in which APCs can be exclusionary, can, um, you know, can, can lead to an arms race of price increases in the same way that subscriptions could and, and, and so forth. Um, but for PLOS to do that was challenging because um, it involved forging ties with libraries that really didn't exist before. If you're a purely APC-based publisher, um, and you've got researchers who can pay for, for their articles out of these big grants. In a way, yeah, PLOS sort of didn't have the relationship with libraries that, for instance, Bearcon does. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that, that, that's an important difference. Um, yeah, I mean, these two business models, this first one around community action publishing, I think is interesting. It is in some ways this kind of read, you know, read and publish model of, of um, institutions paying the fee for authors affiliated with the institution to publish as much as they want in the, the covered titles. Um, you know, the way that PLOS has scoped that, I think is sort of interesting um, that they're not just looking at corresponding authors on these big multi-author papers, but they're looking at all of the other, other authors as well. So on a paper with 50 authors, um, you know, the, the premise is that those authors then have a stake in sort of um, their institution supporting the, the, the journal and, and in some way. Um, the other interesting piece, I guess, is sort of, you know, crediting margins beyond that 10% back to participants in the, in the scheme. And, you know, certainly there, I think the implicit comparison is to kind of the 30 or 35% number um, that is often talked about with the, with the big commercial publishers. Um, the second model around global equity, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was sort of rolled out around specific titles that were thought to be of particular interest um, in, in um, global south or, or developing countries. I think this is an interesting question, right, about sort of, um, yeah, in a way, like the, the, the kind of global northern publishers model of philanthropy that sort of says that, that um, you know, certain titles will be offered um, to, to countries that fall below a certain sort of average income or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, I, this is a different, a different twist on that um, and, and, you know, in part addresses the fact that there are many middle in income countries that sort of fall outside of those, of those sort of um, kind of maximums. Um, but yeah, I mean, so in the, in the key of global equity, then this idea of, of really um, building an author base um, in, in countries outside of the Anglophone Global North, specifically around these, these new titles. Um, so next slide, and I, I think that's my, my last substantive one. Um, so just around editorial policies, um, this was sort of a, a recent announcement that I, I think for anthropologists, um, this, this will probably sound sort of ho-hum, although I think in some of the life sciences fields and public health fields that PLOS publishes, um, 
it, it maybe will make a bigger splash. Um, but there's basically a, a, a reporting based approach asking authors to complete uh, a checklist about how they've approached community inclusion um, when research is being conducted in communities outside where the, the corresponding authors are, are based. Um, and that checklist will be published alongside the article as a, a supplemental file. So there's no kind of minimum standard of engagement or community inclusion that's applied across the board. Um, but reviewers are, you know, are, are encouraged to take that checklist into account as they're, as they're reviewing. And the idea is, of course, to be able to kind of scrape and ramify data um, from this at, at a larger scale. So um, very last slide here, just to conclude. Um, yeah, I guess I just want to leave you with this idea of open and, and I'm curious if it's resonant with, with the other speakers or, or with those who are here. Um, yeah, this idea of needing to sort of specify the commitments that we have over and above open, and that while we might say it's a good thing for articles to be to be freely readable, um, surely that those aren't our only designs on scholarly communication. Those aren't the only values that, that we care about. Um, and I think to the extent that we can articulate those values with open, I think that might be a, a fruitful way to move forward. So thanks so much. Brilliant. Well, a, a, a virtual clap for Marcel. Thank you very much. Really interesting. And I, I think what's been great, Marcel, is you're able to combine your own experience of the hands-on of making cultural anthropology such a great space for anthropology, and then thinking about, um, in a much broader context, what a, a, a mega journal can and can't do. So I think, you know, many of us in anthropology probably don't dwell far beyond our own disciplinary confines and understand the, the the ways in which the, the big science sort of publishing machine works but i think plos has been a little brave attempt at trying to change that and we'd love to ask you more about that um in due course but first i think we'll have all three presenters and then hopefully everyone can hang on to their questions about open and and i think the Stuart hall sort of connection is very interesting so, so well, let's come back to that and marcel um over to vivian please um, um it's your turn Great, thank you so much. Um, I must apologize, there's a lot of construction going on where I am, so if you hear some rumbling or banging, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm okay, it's, it's just right outside the window, I'm afraid. So um, to say thank you for having me, I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I'll just start with a brief introduction, um, and then I'll start by uh, charting the development of open access in Europe. Um, and this is in order to situate the sort of historical and economic context that have brought us here today. I'll show how particularly problematic consequences of the current OA trajectory, some of which Marcel touched upon, can be remedied with the subscribe to open model. I'll then talk about social anthropology's transition to open access using the model. And finally, I'll highlight the ways that you, as the AASA membership, can also help make equitable models like subscribe to open a reality. Uh, next slide, please. So by way of background, although most of you will know us, um, Burkhan Books is an independent publisher founded in 1994 by my mother, Marion Burkhan, who's an anthropologist by training. Um, we are still a family-run firm. My eldest brother and I joined over 20 years ago. And we have offices in Oxford and New York, and we publish journals and books that are highly specialized in their global fields. And, and the specialty of the, our list is you know, also a very key element of the subscribe to open model. Um, we have enjoyed the company of EASA for what is actually nearly two decades, because it goes back to publishing the EASA book series since its first volume in 2003. So now to be working with EASA to realize equitable open access for the ambitions of the journal is really something we're thrilled about. Next slide, please. So how did we get to this particular juncture in scholarly society publishing, especially in Europe? So I'll just sort of touch upon briefly the OA movement um, that also David mentioned at the beginning. Um, so that can be traced back to the 1960s. I mean, there are some key moments in the establishment of what is now an array of organized actions and strategic initiatives to accelerate open access. While much of it, such as Plan S, which is you know, a very real situation for many of us in Europe, feels very top down, the groundswell was actually quite top up and rooted in international library coalitions such as Spark and researcher concerns leading, as Marcel touched upon, to the founding of PLOS, which remains at the forefront of OA transitions. Again, sort of Marcel talked about some of their latest initiatives. In the early 2000s, this led to some formal interventions um, for what felt to be rampant problems um, across the in industry. And at this point, keep in mind, technological advances were also happening. 
And there were two sort of key areas that these um, movements focused on. One was sort of to resolve publication bottlenecks. So author archiving was envisioned. So this was sort of the early sort of discussions about hosting author manuscript versions and online repositories. And the second was to counter the rising costs of subscriptions that were increasingly restricting access to research. So here open access was the answer. In fact, paramount to the whole, all of sort of how all these uh, movements coalesced was about trying to make research publicly available to everybody. And keep in mind, this was above all against the backdrop in the preambles that are very much spelled out, where they discussed the fact that at that time, large publishers were enjoying profit margins that exceeded even those of the oil companies, all while library budgets continue to contract. And of course, those conditions have not changed. And this is why we are talking about the need for many alternative models. So these various interventions um, led to the establishment of the key OA architects of today. And I sort of go into this because this is actually directly relevant to social anthropology and their current slash former publisher, Wiley, who have been you know, a very big publisher in some of these early initiatives. So for instance, Max Planck Digital Library in Germany, they were instrumental in brokering project deal, first with Wiley and then with Springer. And then finally, Coalition S, who were the founding body behind what is now known as Planus. Next slide, please. So Planus was implemented in order to see more decisive steps taken towards the realization of full OA. Initially, there was a discussion of OA 2020, and back then, OA 2020 seemed like, of course, the time by which we would everything would be fully open access. And as 2020 suddenly became two years down the road, one year down the road, it was very clear that we weren't anywhere near where the sort of early architects had envisioned for an open science. So they essentially have this one main target and they have become increasingly mobilized. Um, this target is governed by 10 principles and ultimately they're seeking to now ensure that the resources allocated for open access ensure immediate open access, retain author copyright, which is, of course, has been really key with, some, with a number of publisher policies over the years that have really restricted the way authors can reuse their own work and how the funds are spent. So there is a, there is a lot of conversation about transparency. Next slide, please. So the funding bodies, national and private, endorse Plan S. And in doing so, they take those principles that were on the previous slide and they introduce those into their own grant stipulations. So this is how you as researchers and also publishers feel its effects. So while it seems somewhat removed, it does actually have some very clear knock-on effects. Um, also to how institutions and libraries increasingly um, accredit research and publications that are um, published. Next slide, please. So open access has now become a major contributor to journal output growth. In 2020, it accounted for 36% of all outputs, and it's on trend to be 50% in 2024. We, of course, saw a big spike in publication activity driven by COVID, about COVID, um, and you know, it led to some rather curious um, publishing trends. Um, so this graph here on the right by OA publisher MDPI offers a particularly glaring example. Next slide, please. Thank you. So while an APC-centric approach was already in circulation, it was very early on, as, as Marcel noted, you know, native, OA native publishers like PLOS were founded on APC models. It's the establishment of these mandates that really led to an explosion in APC-funded um, OA articles known as gold open access, which often at staggering price tags, which <laughs> Marcel already touched upon. But even the average APC is two to 3,000 euros per article. Next slide, please. So the use of APCs to realize OA mandates resulted in a number of unintended, albeit not unforeseen consequences, um, some of which have been remedied along the way and very much situates where we are now. There was a proliferation of quote unquote predatory OA publishers. New tools were created to guide researchers to identify the right publisher for them. However, such labels and how they are applied has been duly problematized. See David's um, recent article on this matter. 
libraries were challenged when they saw what they saw was double dipping. So they were essentially paying for subscriptions while at the same time journals were charging APCs. So increasingly paywall content became more open, but libraries were still paying for it the same way as when it was all closed. Furthermore, you had some libraries who were locked into, or well, many libraries who were locked into multi-year and multi-million euro big deals. So they turned to tools like Unsub, which has increasingly gained, tra gained traction to help them free up resources for OA and tackle their huge library spends. So here we're seeing a lot of libraries and a lot has been in the news, especially um, with respect to Elsevier big deals, with libraries simply breaking and, and not renewing um, the kind of big deals that previously were renewed year on year, um, while with some crumbling, still, still renewed year on year. And then last but not least, we have the transformative agreements. And this is best characterized by the read and publish deals that are brokered between libraries and the same very large publishers that triggered these earlier OA movements. And the key here is transformative because there have been a lot of discussions between the various funders and these publishers to talk about how do we now transform to open access? Next slide, please. So there's been no doubt that we've seen significant shifts to open access. I mean, you'll have seen the graph with the proliferation of journals, but overall, OA, especially in certain STM fields, has definitely grown. But as we touched upon at the very beginning, at what cost and for whom? And there remain certain consequences that are still very much unchecked. And this is, again, where subscribe to open comes in. So on the competition side, there was a recent working paper that analyzed whether Project Deal creates incentives for authors in their choice of submission. And it's found already statistically significant increases in the likelihood that authors will publish in an eligible Springer or Wiley journal. And one can only also wonder to what extent this creates pressures on editors to accept articles from these regions. Revenue, financial statements of the big deal transformative agreement publishers regularly points to open access as a source of revenue growth and their profit margins continue. And above all, rising inequity. Given the predominance of transformative agreements, the rise of APCOA has disproportionately benefited researchers in select regions. So in this map, you can see how APC-centric OA has currently served social anthropology. Not well, as is characteristic of this approach, especially for social science humanities journals, which is above all what is so very problematic about many of these APC-centric approaches. Next slide, please. This brings us to subscribe to open. So this is a model that intentionally tackles the risks of further market consolidation by these big deals that are now called transformative agreements and the inequities of APCs that are driving many of these big deals. So what is subscribe to open? The model is a simple one. Essentially libraries allocate funds by continuing to subscribe. They're using the same channels as before. They're receiving the same journals as before, including access to the, to the full backfile as before. And it essentially mimics the current normal subscription process. So libraries don't have to change anything in order to essentially participate in open access, whereas a lot of these current um, open access agreements require lengthy and very convoluted and complicated negotiations. I mean, we are also talking generally about massive sums of money in these big deals. So as a result, the great thing is that all libraries can participate in this model. So there aren't these sorts of barriers to access that even libraries face, as do smaller publishers. For instance, the same well-resourced libraries who are able to broker these read and publish deals have also been key and very early supporters of Subscribe to Open. But these big deals also don't work for many library systems, whether it's because of their resources or size, many read institutions as they're called, so like institutions that focus on teaching and less on research and publication outputs. For them, read and publish deals are also not really the right solution. So Subscribe to Open, again, offers them a really great way to continue to use the very easy mechanisms of subscribing in order to support open access for their faculty. Next slide, please. So the Subscribe to Open model originated with annual reviews, and our own path started following a meeting with Libraria initiated by one of our journal editors. 
So Libraria has been instrumental throughout our own process as well as in EASA's own journey in moving to open access. As you can see from our timeline, our process was one of very careful consideration of the many pros and cons of going OA, involving many stakeholders all along the way. It's obviously a great concern not only for us, but all of our journals that this be done sustainably. It is a risk, but a calculated risk, and one that we felt was worth it. You can read a more detailed history of our journey in a recent blog post, where I also situate our model in the publishing and OA context in further detail that I just touched upon at the start. Next slide, please. So our second year of the Burke on Open Afro is now in full swing. So far, we've been really pleased with the response, not only in the library support through renewal, strong renewals, even at the collections level, but even at the single one at a time um, subscriptions level. But usage has, of course, increased exponentially. 2020 was obviously a rather wacky year when we opened everything with COVID, but you can see 2021 is a really steady and strong trajectory of this model really settling in. Above all, look at this spread of open access publishing. Since our first OA issues published in 2020, we have published over 300 research articles and over 100 other non-APC eligible formats in immediate full open access. From 2017 to 2019, those same journals published a total of 14 APC funded OA articles. As we know, the money simply isn't there for APC funded OA. Next slide, please. As we now look ahead to our third year, we are delighted to welcome social anthropology to the collection. And we're in the midst of transitioning the journal to a full APC free open access as of 2022, if we can get all of the libraries to transition over their subscriptions from what were previously Wiley big deals to a subscribe to open subscription. As many of you witnessed, the AASA members voted overwhelmingly to take the journal away by this model. APC OA was not working as the map shows. So this map indicates how the, um, in 2020, under a big deal, um, how social anthropology was able to publish in open access versus all of the regions that um, currently weren't supported by open access because of the APC prominence of the model. So this is truly a community-led open access initiative in action. Next slide, please. And so just to underline that, so why? So if you take a look at the left, you'll see what APC Driven OA looks like for social anthropology. And to the right, you'll see what open access publishing looks like using the subscribe to open model. Every single article can be made available open access. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so how have we spent this past year? So we are in the midst of transitioning the journal over and we're really appreciative of the support that we've had from the editorial team. Um, we've been you know, doing all the basics. And of course, part of that is now transitioning all of the libraries over to this model. So renewals are now underway, but this is where you as the AASA membership come in. Next slide, please. So how and why can the EASA community support social anthropology in its transition? Because it is a transition. And without the full support of libraries, it is, un it is not possible for us to make the journal open access in a sustainable way. But you as the membership, as authors and readers, researchers are key stakeholders in how journal selections are made outside of the world of big deals. So by going and advocating to your library, you can ensure that trusted and valued journals survive and can continue to publish now with the added benefit of an APC free open access. So how would you go about this? It's really important and maybe we can talk about this in the discussion to be informed of your institution's open access strategy. I was just at a library meeting um, last week and, you know, librarians talk about they all, you know, have very strong ideas about open access and are really in the midst of creating their own open access strategies. And it's really important that you as a researcher have a voice in how your institution is mapping out its own open strategy. So that would include advocating for a model like this, which ultimately means asking your library to subscribe and then ensuring that it renews year on year. And of course, reading the journal, using the journal, publishing in the journal as you did before. 
These are all key ways to ensure that the journal remains relevant and sustainable. A final slide, please. And so in closing, I wanted to sort of emphasize that discipline-driven initiatives like using Subscribe to Open for Social Anthropology are vital for ensuring bibliodiversity. And this is ultimately why we are here and doing what we are doing. The current OH trajectories were not good news for many society publishers and their journals, especially in, so in the social sciences and humanities. So the decision for the AASA membership to go down this path is a really powerful example that many other associations who are struggling with these very same concerns are watching um, because they, of course, are too very keen to see how they can ensure a more equitable and accessible open access trajectory for their journals while remaining sustainable, as scholarly journals are, of course, an important part of an association's ecosystem. But ultimately, we need your help to make this decision and to make sure that this decision was the right move, a researcher advocacy is a really key component of this model. So we really are, we're asking you to do just that. Advocate for a model like this, which is really bringing about equitable bibliodiversity. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, um, Vivian. There's um, loads, loads to, to take up there. Um, I'm realizing that one of the things we're doing here is we're giving giving our audience quite a, a, um, a sort of in-depth dive into the political economy of publishing and the twists and turns of that economy. And, and I mean, it, it's really important people understand that, isn't it? I, mean, I think, you know, we, even if even if the, the concept of having to pay to publish isn't familiar with many people in European anthropology, it's absolutely part of everyday life getting by in a bibliometric economy for many. So, so, so trying to get your head around that thought that you're having to look at the price tag every time you publish an article is, is a very different way to think about publishing. We will um, come back to some of the things you've been saying, and I'd love to hear more about how your campaign is going. But I'm first going to ask Angela to take us um, into a new, in, a new part of the debate, which is thinking about a sort of more decolonial approach to infrastructures. Angela. Sure, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I will apologize if there's any child noise in the background. My, my kids are getting ready for school here. Um, thank you so much, David and team, for hosting um, such an important discussion. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel with Marcel and Vivian. Um, and I'm going to jump right into the presentation, given our time constraints. Um, is it okay if I ask you to also just um, do the next slides for me? Thank you. So next. I click the icon to quickly save a paper into my reference manager. A big red X indicates I can't download the PDF. I scroll down and see that the paper on decolonizing decolonization requires 42 US dollars to purchase. If I wanted to read the whole issue, it was 430 US dollars, more than many university lectures in Kenya make in a month. I navigate to the virtual private network. I log into my UC Irvine account. I refresh the page and suddenly additional text appears. In fact, I can't check the price of purchasing the article now, even if I wanted to. I click the icon again, a bright red, green, a bright green check mark. The PDF has successfully been deposited to my computer. Unfortunately, I don't circulate unpublished work for citation. This was the response I received from the host of an event series focused on decolonizing the university when I emailed asking if his opening presentation was available to cite. He had beautifully presented so many of the issues regarding post-structural adjustment changes to African university systems that I wanted to address in my own writing. I wanted to build on his work by citing it and referring others to him and his work. But my request was refused because he hadn't yet published it in a peer-reviewed academic journal, he implied. The secrecy and proprietary sensibility encountered through this event and others has been surprising to me, especially coming from scholars so explicit about their interest in decolonizing knowledge production. Even though they were public events at a public university, presentations were rarely open to any outsiders, recordings of the events weren't available, and there were never any meeting notes or reflective blog posts the events were enclosed on many different registers. So with the one-two punch of these vignettes, I want to convey some of the social technical material practices through which the geopolitics of knowledge are perpetuated. 
The enclosures of critical scholarship on decolonizing the university are counterintuitive and all the more so when done within privileged spaces of elite universities. The irony of not being able to access a scholarly journal article on knowledge justice that sits behind a paywall continues to be as striking to me today as it was seven years ago when I was compiling my grads to wool applications. Such a stark contradiction uh, that despite all of the ink spilled about extractive scholarly knowledge practices, the everyday ways that this knowledge gains legitimacy and circulates hasn't fundamentally changed is what has kept me particularly attuned to the infrastructure question. Next slide, please. So just briefly, I want to describe a bit the context from where I speak um, before I move into mapping some of the concepts that I've been working with over the last several years, both theoretical and vernacular, to argue that a nuanced understanding of open access requires us not only to look at how scholarly objects circulate around the world, but also the existing unequal and inequitable structures through which they circulate. I think our scholarship will appear increasingly contradictory unless we turn our critical attention to the knowledge infrastructures through which this work circulates. Next. My work is largely informed by five years of firsthand experience working in the production of tech and development research at Nairobi's first co-working space for technologists, which we call the iHub, uh, imaged here um, of the original iHub space. Next. While living and working at the IHUB in Nairobi from 2010 to 2015, I helped to also bring into formation and coordinate a network called the Open and Collaborative Science and Development Network, what we refer to as OCSDNet for short. The network included scientists, development practitioners, community activists from 26 countries in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. And for two years under 12 projects, network members studied how an open approach to science might contribute to sustainable development. And this is really what was the basis for my growing understanding of the nuances of open. So I returned to the academy, um, to UC Irvine, specifically in Southern California in 2015. And based on my work um, within the anthropology department over the last decade, building on the, the last decade that I've been working with Nairobi's tech for good sector, and then a year of ethnographic research with organizations in Kenya's research landscapes. I've been studying the production of scientific knowledge in Kenya and specifically looking at shifts in what's considered good and ethical research. Next, please. Before I go any further, I just wanna briefly map the conceptual landscape that shaped my own thinking. And I apologize if this is familiar to many of you. Um, I just wanna make sure we're all together. So infrastructures are the systems that enable circulation of goods, knowledge, meaning, people, and power. A core text in infrastructure studies is Susan Lee Starr's work, which understands infrastructure as a relational entity that emerges for people in practice and structure. And so what that means is that infrastructure is built on other layers. At the same time, it's shaped and constrained by its relations to them. And so in this case, uh, infrastructures are, are embedded in other structures, social arrangements, and technologies. So I want to emphasize, and I emphasize on this slide, the social technical aspect of infrastructure, because it's in this sense that I use the term throughout the rest of the presentation, but social technical infrastructure is also a mouthful, so I am just going to use infrastructure. <laughs> Next, please. In particular, I've been working on studying what scholars have called knowledge infrastructure. So Paul Edwards defined knowledge infrastructure as a robust network of people, artifacts, and institutions that generate, share, and maintain specific knowledge about the human and natural worlds. And he expands on this work um, in further work, uh, really calling attention to the multi-layered um, systems and the fact that these different systems can each have their own unique goals and origins, and they're made to interoperate. Uh, Star names nine properties of infrastructure, and in particular, I want to draw attention to the fact that infrastructure does not spring out of nowhere. It's built on an installed base from which it inherits both strengths and weaknesses. Next. So one base for Kenya's contemporary knowledge infrastructure, like other former British colonies, can be understood through a genealogy of British colonial systems transportation, research, and otherwise, that laid the basis for future waves of foreign scientists coming to the region. 
This colonial research infrastructure fostered and was furthered through a eugenics movement in Kenya that flourished in the 1930s, the African Research Survey published in 1938, a growing international development regime that followed World War II, growth in market research, which followed the neoliberalization of the economy, and of course, the ongoing flurry of tech development, which was just getting off the ground when I arrived in Kenya in 2010. But there's another base to the Kenyan knowledge infrastructure that I also want to share, which I've learned from Kenyan British librarian Shiraz Durrani's rich history of Kenyan publishing, which goes back to the end of the 1800s. Colonial laws prevented the African population in Kenya from owning printing presses or newspapers. But Shiraz describes how this was bypassed through oral communication systems and fugitive methods like writing Kiswahili Chandani, which is Kiswahili of the inside. Resistance messages on conga cloths, and I've inserted a contemporary image of conga here, um, where you can see the Swahili messaging at the bottom. And so these are typically worn as skirts or wraps um, to this day, and the messages are very powerful because they reach audiences um, in mother tongue or, or in Swahili and also right in their own homes. Shiraz also shares how one of the local radical papers uh, from around the 1950s, Nyota ya Kirinyaga, Kirinyaga Star, was owned and run by a carpenter, a shoemaker, driver, sign writer, a bookbinder, several clerks, traders, and farmers. And so I think this provides a really inspiring um, alternative of a publishing and knowledge infrastructure owned and run collectively by diverse members of the public, um, which is also the readership. So there's a small and growing community of diverse progressive libraries, they call themselves their progressive libraries in the city, um, that are drawing inspiration from these kinds of histories. Next, please. My thinking has also been heavily influenced by Benin philosopher Pauline Hontonji's conceptualization of extroverted science. And that is scientific research on the African continent intended to make, to meet the theoretical needs and questions of the Western Academy and not the society within which the science is actually being conducted. Um, to Marcel's point earlier about, about helicopter researchers. Uh, he gives a, a concrete example that many of the research articles are published in journals located outside of the African continent and therefore meant for non-African readership. Next slide. Relatedly, Francis Nemonjo offers the concept of epistemic imperialism, which also relates to the late Syed Hussein Alata's writing on intellectual imperialism how to address not only legacy geohistories of colonialism, but also the layered histories of development with a big D, structural adjustment and techno solutionism. In the late 1980s and 90s, and this is probably a history again, everyone here knows, but just to reiterate, because it's important to keep in mind, international financial institutions like the World Bank and IMF called for the overhauling of state institutions in much of the global South to align with neoliberal ideas about you know, the necessary conditions for greater economic development. And Kenya was one of these countries in the global South forced to implement what we call structural adjustment programs or SAPs. These programs coupled with the authoritarian regime of Kenya's second president in the eighties and nineties really gutted local infrastructures of knowledge and research, including the public libraries um, and also the universities, which were vibrant centers of anti-colonial and anti-authoritarian resistance in the 1960s and 70s. So SAPs have been heavily critiqued, um, you know, since they were ruled out by, by both practitioners, development scholars, and even the bank itself. Um, but the logics and the effects of SAPs are really far from over. Unfortunately, next slide. So what does epistemic imperialism and extroverted science look like? This image is probably familiar to many of you, um, has been used to help visualize the underrepresentation of knowledge from particular parts of the world. And often the conclusion drawn from this image is that global scientific community needs to work to have more representation from certain parts of the world. We need to bring in and share work by more African researchers is something I've heard at a conference in response to this map. Next. But published where and by who? So while the issue of under and over representation isn't to be dismissed by any means, I nonetheless find that articulations of the problem and solution that are framed around national or regional representation alone 
risks reproducing the same oversimplified fetishes and categories, north, south, center, periphery, without actually undermining the asymmetrical knowledge infrastructure that positions certain people and places over others. So at a 2019 workshop on scholarly publishing that I attended in Nairobi, um, the co-organizer, Dr. Divine Fu, stated decisively, open access will further marginalize people. If the University of Nairobi does not have a printing press and doesn't think that investing in its university press is a political project to give it a voice, that is a problem. It is doing what Pauline Hontonji called scientific extroversion. Once you build such local publishing infrastructure, then open access can kick in. It can be a public good. But how many African countries have that research foundation today? And I also just want to say hi to Stephanie Kitchen, who is also um, at that workshop and I see in the audience here. So I have already mentioned the oral traditions and fugitive publishing practices under colonial rule in Kenya. Uh, soon after independence in the 1970s and, and early 80s, parastatals and independent indigenous publishing houses began being established in African capitals like Nairobi. But these emerging operations and institutions were then quickly undercut by the structural adjustment programs I just referred to in the 80s. And this gave African scholars little alternative but to turn to organizations and the social technical publishing systems in Europe and North America. So today scholarly publishing in and on Africa still remains largely dominated by corporate academic publishers headquartered in cities around the global north. And the notion of open access, which began, as we know, as a movement that was concerned about democratizing who can contribute and access scholarly knowledge, I think an important critique of this normative open access today is that it doesn't fundamentally change or undo the already established unequal knowledge infrastructure or address the underinvestment in African publishing institutions themselves. And so I think the urgency of this point is underlined by growing body of of scholarship, which indicates that the label of open access is in fact re-entrenching the power of traditional academic publishers who are now using a revised business model. And this is something that um, Vivian and Marcel referred to. Um, next, please. So this is just uh, a quick screenshot that I took just the other day, um, right? And it's from Elsevier's website and it says, open access, Elsevier is moving fast to meet the different demands for open access. And they are indeed. Um, and I think an important point is that if funders and planners who are trying to support more global circulation of knowledge don't pay attention to who owns the scholarly infrastructure that they're requiring scientists to use, then we can find in the pursuit of opening up access, the power of established corporate publishing giants actually becomes further consolidated. And so unless we make changes that are explicitly differentiating between types of scholarly publishers, the money paid to support open access will likely increase shareholder profits rather than support the survival of small independent scholarly publishers. Next, please. So here is just a doozy of a diagram that everyone again has probably already seen, but it helps to make this point more concrete. Um, this image is comprised of the logos of many formerly open tools that have since been bought up and consolidated under one scholarly publishing company, in this case, Elsevier. You might recognize and probably recognize some of these logos. These are services that many of us use on an everyday basis. In fact, it's increasingly becoming hard not to use them because they're now opt out instead of opt in systems. And so the growing corporatization of these platform systems that have become a ubiquitous part of global knowledge infrastructure, not just publishing, but these are increasingly becoming data analytics companies. And so they span the, the research life cycle. Um, and this is something we really need to wrestle with. Next slide. So those of us concerned with decolonizing knowledge need to look not only at who is doing the research work, but equally important, turn a critical gaze on the structures through which knowledge circulates. Who owns, designs, and makes decisions about these structures? And this beautiful image by Julia Forsyth is of course a play off of the Elsevier logo. Next. You'll recall a variation of this map appeared earlier in the talk. Um, this version is actually a found object from my field site and was being used uh, by one of the interlocutors who was presenting on why their research in particular coming from Africa against the geopolitics of world knowledge production was important. And I don't disagree with this. 
But I hope to have also raised your attention during the talk to the fact that an overemphasis on improving the inclusion of previously marginalized groups into scientific systems can easily miss the bigger point that until we train our eyes on the established infrastructures of power, there's risk in conflating representation uh, with decolonization of these said infrastructures. So to me, this map is less a reflection of the problem itself, but rather shows us the effects of the established dominant infrastructure. In other words, decolonizing knowledge can't be undertaken unless the infrastructure layer is studied and worked on. So future work reaching for decolonizing knowledge, I think needs to more expressly begin to encode our values, exactly playing nicely into what Marcel set up um, into the social technical material knowledge infrastructures we use. And I think this includes right, the underlying frameworks of evaluation against which scholarly knowledge is looked at, questioning current standards of scholarly credibility, including peer review and measures of impact. Thank you. With last slide, just to, to say thanks and leave my, my contacts. Um, thank you so much. And I look forward to discussion. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. That was really, really brilliant. A great way to round this um, set of talks off. I think you, you really push hard to make us think um, you know, about what it really would mean to um, rebuild infrastructures for a decolonial knowledge practice and, and, and the resources required to do that. And as you, as you say, Elsevier launched um, um, Scientific African a year last year and they had a very low APC charge because this was their way of making use of their infrastructure to try and undercut local journals. So I mean, you know, the, the stakes are very high. Um, we now have to have just over 20 minutes for um, uh, comments, questions. Um, if you're feeling brave in the audience and um, you, you are able to come on stage, there are two podia. Um, so that would be lovely, to, lovely if you would just would promote yourself and, and ask your question. Um, obviously, we can ask a question for you if you want to post it in the question box. Um, but, but please do come forward if you have any thoughts or comments, whether it's about um, our journal, whether it's about um, PLOS or, or some of the things that Angela was talking about. Um, and I have two raised hands, so that's brilliant. Um, I'm gonna um, ask Maria to, to come on stage to start with. a slight problem here with um, connectivity, aren't we? Um, Maria. That's better, hopefully. David, the stage is yours. We can hear you, David, if you want to speak. Thank you such um, three really interesting. I want to make one general comment and make a practical suggestion. The general comment really relates to, um, well, comments that have been scattered through all presentations. It's about the importance of peer review and critically editorial contributions to maintain standards and, and as and the importance of this to maintain a distinction with predatory journals which will publish anything if you pay a hundred dollars um the worry about that of course is that peer review doesn't work so well and can be exclusionary um but i'll we need to acknowledge that, but um, that doesn't mean some form of quality control isn't important. Um, practical suggestion, it comes um, from the uh, open and multilingual um, that Marcel kind of had on a slide. One thing that could happen tomorrow is that if an article was published in a open about 
a com a local community and one of the abstracts should be in a locally readable language so publishing something about about indonesia why isn't there an indonesian bahasa indonesian um uh, abstract um you know top position for something to do with png etc um and of course we really should always have spanish and chinese as languages simply because there are three world languages um but yeah that's me thank you david um should we hear from maria and then give the um so the, the questions you raise are around around the importance of peer review and and translation stroke politics of 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 um, abstracts and and reaching out, uh, Maria, your turn. Yeah, thanks a lot to all the speakers. Do you hear me now? Yeah, cool. And it was really informative, and I'm hoping that we can publish that through Nomadites uh, YouTube channel. But my my question is related maybe to a site that you all touched upon, but only partly, and which is the site that I study maybe and I'm more interested in, which is universities and libraries. So I think in, in all the appeal to, you know, we have to contact libraries, there is a, a very old fashioned almost view of how libraries work nowadays. You know, what is the university library? And that has been transforming a lot in terms of, I, I was recently interviewed by something new that's called faculty, where they produce these 20 minutes video clips with scholars and that you know they interview you they post it it's a nice resource but of course they kind of then enclose it and they say your library has to pay 0 comma 99 pounds to access it so i had to contact my library but there's no way to contact the library you know the library is not something as it used to be you know first they said contact your local lib you know your subject librarian there's no subject librarian there's also no subject library in my university which is the university of Strathclyde. when you think of who works at the library and you know how they're positioned this is some of the most precarious stuff and decisions can be made extremely um you know randomly arbitrarily and so forth not because of people's lack of knowledge but because of you know lack of follow-up with decisions that are made so I'm just wondering, you know, is, is there something there as well that we need to address? Because if we really rely on libraries for, for the implementation of this model, we might be actually dealing with a whole other you know, level of the problem. And how do we how do we think of libraries or you know who, who do we contact? Where, where is actually the, the kind of source of decision making in all these issues? um and then the, the other question you know that that i think again angela touched upon is the, the data collection process so there will be a lot of opportunities that are going to go for the open access model and promote themselves not because they care about knowledge production and distribution but because that would be yet another way to harvest big data from university users you know learning analytics and so on and so forth so how do we protect, um, especially I'd say vulnerable populations in the global south, you know, in the in the countries that we want to reach out to in order to give access from turning them into free producers of data and for marketing purposes. You know? so, so I don't think we know the questions. I'm just kind of putting that there and I'm sure you've all thought about that. So I, I'd just kind of be interested in your answers and I know we're all working towards it so it's not it's not the final word yeah thank you great should we just take one more question and then we can answer this three in a group um Alok do you want to come up on stage and ask your question which it sort of relinks and I think it'd be very useful for us to have a, a sense of um how things are going for, for social anthropology as well in terms of that question Maria asks around promoting people um, rather, sort of promoting the journal to, to libraries. Alok. Yeah. 
this connection sometimes takes longer than you want, doesn't it? Um, I wonder why. This is the challenge of global knowledge, global knowledge exchange. Um, what? Why don't? Why don't we start while we're waiting to see how it comes on stage? Do Do any of you want to respond to those questions um, um, that we just heard from Maria and David? I mean, also. Oh, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, I think just from the library perspective, I mean, absolutely, I think um, libraries have undergone a profound shift and change in the last few years. I mean, budgets have long been contracting. And I think, you know, in the last decade where we've seen the, the prominence of big deals that has really taken a shift to quantitative um, collection approaches, also to usage and, and the way sort of collections were assessed and valued. And this then, of course, has led to making library, um, I mean, Marcel, you, you can speak best to the library um, career trajectory, but making it ever more precarious. Um, but they are still there. And I think that is sort of part of where a lot of these open access transitions come about, is that there is still money within the subscription system. So the question is, how is it circulating and how do we recirculate it? So a lot of the conversations that are happening now within the library community is about reinvestment strategies. So taking all of those subscription funds that went into these big deals and how do they take all of these? So Unsub, which I touched upon, is really a tool that helps libraries analyze their spend relative to usage. And what many of them are finding is they're spending millions of dollars on these Elsevier packages and only portions are being used. And they're finding in the end that there are other ways that they can serve their faculty by reducing and reshifting and reallocating. I mean, all of us for whom monographs are still important have seen also what a detrimental impact this has had on monographs um, and collections over the years. So, you know, there, this is still an area that, um, is, that still exists, but indeed is precarious. And I think this is why I also brought in the funder piece because funders is the ones shifting the OA acceleration also you know, need to be accountable for funding it. And I think they have come out more recently to address and, and recognize the challenges of these APC-driven models. And I, you know, there are some reports that I didn't go into. Um, I felt my slides were already long enough, but um, you know, they have recently come out and talked about the importance to engage with smaller publishers, society publishers, especially in the humanities and um, social sciences as well as to move away from APC models and to reallocate funds. So for instance, UKRI in the UK, in the UK are talking about block grants being allocated and can then be used to support initiatives like Subscribe to Open. So there is sort of this shift among the library community on the one hand to reinvest subscription income into open access initiatives, while also those funds you know, are dwindling, COVID, in some cases has led to cuts, other cases has led to resources being shifted again to open access. But then ultimately this is why the funders come in are, and remain an important piece where there is funding um, to really help, help us kind of create multiple um, channels to support the initiative. I agree. I would just add on the library point that, right, I mean, I actually think that mapping how the sort of um, centers of gravity for decision making in libraries around scholarly communication is changing is is on on the one hand like a worthy research project for ethnographers of higher education and for you know I mean I actually think that's something that that we could stand to understand better um, you know at a landscape level um, but I also think that probably you know individual researchers trying to figure out how to advocate within their institutions there is a bit of that kind of um, you know, kind of institutional ethnography that you end up doing sort of, you know, in your own institution to understand. So for instance, I would say a place to start would be, is there a scholarly communication librarian at your institution? That would be sort of one place to start. Um, and the reality is not all scholarly communication librarians have much um, authority to decide. They don't all control their own budgets. Sometimes they really are liaisons and they exist to sort of know about resources, but they don't control pots of money. 
Um, I'd say that's changing. And I would say that where in a library org chart, scholarly communication lives tends to be moving upward sort of toward, um, you know, associate university librarian level or, or yeah, I mean, it's sort of um, above the role of kind of a, a purely service function. And indeed, I think how collections budgets are being structured at libraries is itself changing such that open access isn't just sort of the, you know, the add on there, 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 that there's not one pot that all of the OA spend has to come out of, but actually is sort of being baked into sort of traditional subject based acquisitions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, a really concrete place to start, I would say, would be to look for that scholarly communication librarian um, and, and, and to work your way sort of out from there. Um, and maybe just to, to Marie's question here, just because I, I see that in the chat as well, I just wanted to say, as you know, it's the same question about as an individual researcher, I think there's this advocacy function. And then I think there's also kind of identifying um, you know, what, what venues are, yeah, that, that there are venues that are not going to charge you an APC today, right? And so Bergkhan has, has 13 journals today uh, that you can publish in open access without, without an APC. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are other sort of diamond OA journals um, associated with scholarly societies, associated with, with independent publishers, um, small kind of scholar-led projects like Roadsides, which I mentioned earlier. And I would also mention, like, if the journal that you're looking at, you know, if the right journal for what you are trying to publish is still a paywall journal, then I would say really take full advantage of being able to post that author's version. Most publishers at this point are comfortable with that, right? So even the big commercial publishers are comfortable with authors' versions being published. It's just that most author most authors don't know about that, right? And, and in a sense, they count on that, right? They 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 count on the fact that we know less about the rights that we retain under the licensing agreements that we sign to share our work. Um, because if everybody did it, right, then then the the system would look different than it does. So I would just say, you know. There are OA journals out there and there are OA options, even if a paywall journal feels like the right, the right fit for a particular piece that you're trying to publish. I, I thank you very much. That's both really helpful in terms of giving us clues as to how to where to turn, how to look. But Angela, I mean, I, I wonder whether you want to come in on, on Alok's really important question um, about, you know, it's not simply about um, having an you know, APC free journal. It's, it's about the research sort of culture and the the sort of awareness of the journal structure but also i guess it's about um local library infrastructures as well you know and so if i'm putting myself in, the, in a, into a situation of a researcher in a in nigerian university um you know uh, it, it, the, the challenge is that the, there isn't a national um sort of science infrastructure which is sort of what you're raising isn't it it's, it's actually how does one begin to put money into that but also then how does one find out about journals that one could potentially publish in, but doesn't don't speak to one's own research ecosystem or, or knowledge. But you know, Angela, what were your thoughts on all this, please? Right, and I think I would just say like, it's not that there isn't an existing science infrastructure, but often that has been set up to be in the service of extroverted science. And so I think that often you find that what people are looking at is that you want to publish in an outside, you know, more valuable journal. And, you know, things like the impact factors and all of that just, exacerbates that um, rather than helping to unsettle that. And so I think that, you know, part of what I was going to say with regards to the data collection question as well is that there is actually growing and quite vocal pushback against, you know, the usual tech giants like Facebook um, and Alphabet and the like in terms of data collection and all of this, um, you know, in, in the communities I work with in Kenya. But there really is little to no attention being paid to the academic publishing big five, if you will, right? And the kind of, um, they're, they're often being framed as the good guys, um, you know, who are, are helping uh, run these free workshops on how to, you know, do open access well, or, you know, this professionalization. And so, so much of the capacity building work um, that's being done with the communities that I, I do my work with is, is around professionalizing, again, to continue this kind of extroverted science in publishing in these international. Global is another, you know, I think, Marcel, you mentioned global. In my context where I do a lot of work, global is often just a stand-in for Euro-America, right? It's not actually global. And so I think that that is an important 
aspect that I, I'm in some ways trying to push back is like we need to seed conversations like this to think more carefully about what it is that we're actually doing this work for and for who and for why, you know, and I think that um, I was going to actually read a look's question because it seems he can't because I work with a look. So, <laughs> so I have a chance often to talk with a look. Um, and, and, you know, my response would be that exactly we need to, you know, start working more more carefully with communities in community and and actually see whether it's in-person workshops or you know i think those are the places where you start to build those relations and so a lot of my own work um is really thinking about how do we build um the relationality around this this whether it's a data object whether it's a journal object whatever it is like as a way to build relationships um and so yeah i but i will read it just because it couldn't you know, I think he's curious to, to hear about, um, per perhaps from Vivian, especially, you know, uh, the, the subscribe to open access model and about the connection to bibliodiversity um, and how does it ensure bibliodiversity and then more about at ESTS, which I'm also an associate editor with. Um, we've been open access from day one, Diamond OA without ABCs, and yet our authorship is overwhelmingly Euro-American. So you know, drawing from that, it's not open access by itself that's the solution. What else has to happen? Thank you for that question. So I think, you know, I think absolutely the, the question of also local knowledge production is key. And I and I think also David and I were on a panel a couple of weeks ago and it, you know, I think there also some, some of the, these are areas that also David spoke to. And I think, you know, I've become very aware of the need to check ourselves as when we talk about, especially in Subscribe to Open, when we talk about equity and, and you know, global access. I mean, this is obviously still then within a Euro-American context, right? And so I think really um, I've become quite aware of the need to make sure that that's caveated, right? When we are talking about um, equity, because that is a big piece of the model of Subscribe to Open. Um, but the idea is then how can it be... Um, made accessible also beyond journals of our size, beyond our geographies. And I think, you know, to the point about biodiversity, um, for sure there are there is a thriving diamond open access, um, you know, sort of environment out there. And there was recently a big study on that. Um, you know, a lot of this is institutional support. I mean, ultimately somebody has to pay for it. And I think that is always the question. Um, and I think, so for us, Subscribe to Open is very much currently being um, used by publishers who are medium-sized society publishers. And ultimately, so when I talk about biodiversity, I mean in the context of the current trajectory of transformative agreements are doing what big deals were doing. They are eradicating and leading to market consolidation. Publishers are being bought by Elsevier, by Wiley, or they're, or they're simply societies above all, which is really key are being dropped by some of their larger publishers. So there, there's a real issue of also um, future relevance and sustainability for many of these journals and societies. Again, I mean, this is in the Euro-American context. So open access clearly is not um, the solution, especially when we talk about how best to support local knowledge, knowledge infrastructures, um, as Angela touched upon, which I think is also a big piece to this um, and, and definitely not adequately addressed even within the funders, you know, they are still very much in a local European, in this case, context. The way they apply and talk about open access is very much within the European funding structure that even can't translate to North America. I mean, this is where in North America, the library community has actually been leading the drive for open access, which is a very different approach to how open access is being um, sort of um, promoted and, and pushed along. Um, I think to the point about how do we then address publishing, but again, what I'm then suggesting is how are we talking about publishing other scholars in Euro-American journals? But I think it takes us back to David's original question, David Zeitlin, about peer review and quality. And I think this is also about the need to continue to really invest in production, copy editing, you know, and, and editorial practices, peer review practices. I think there are a number of journals who have become very aware of the need as part of their peer review process to review their citation practices and, and to review how and, you know, what kind of directions they give to their peer reviewers when assessing an article. Because a lot of that, if you aren't, if you don't fully appreciate the scholarly framework 
where the author is coming from because it doesn't fit some Euro-American scholarly framework, then it will get rejected for reasons that, you know, aren't, that are they're ultimately still creating barriers to publication. So I think there is sort of a, um, a whole range of, of questions that come into play that, that above all mean that it's vital for publishers um, to really make sure and, and work with their editors and their journals to think about how do we not sort of, um, how do we, how, how can we be, be part of the solution rather than the problem? Um, but again, you know, I'm then talking about Euro-American journals. So we're not addressing how do we create infrastructures to support local knowledge production. And that is, I think, a key, key area that's missing in all of this conversation about equity. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Vivian. And we're, I'm aware we sort of having to, to sort of go from the big sort of political questions to the to the everyday stuff of who's reviewing and how how that how that happens. Um, I'm gonna. I know we've almost finished. We really must wrap up quite quickly. I'd like Stephanie Kitchen to come up and ask her question as well, though, because I think she has, you know, a lot of experience of thinking about how you might build um, certain data repositories in African universities, but also um, infrastructures that are African focused as well. Uh, Stephanie, can you promote yourself? I don't think it's to promote you. No, no Shindig can sometimes be a bit annoying. <laughs> so, so, so I guess you know, just to finish, then her, her her point was really one of the fact that um, many of the early initiatives, obviously, and, and, and ongoing initiatives in in anthropology, in African anthropology, were not necessarily open access. Um, and so, so again, that, that there you could say there's a way in which um, um, there's a, there's a parallel to the conversations going on there around what's important for um, communities of practice. Um, and it isn't simply it isn't simply a, a one publishing model. Um, we have a couple. Uh, d d d uh, let me just um, let me just ask Daniel to come up as well because he's also raised his hand. Oh, don't you love Shindig? Okay. Um, sort of promises so much and doesn't quite get there sometimes. <laughs> it's as if we just can't quite, haven't quite got the bandwidth. Danielle, it's yours, yours. Hi. Oh, I'm here. Oh, wow, amazing. <laughs> I was <laughs> typing the question. So thank you all for this great set of talks. I mean, I'm, I'm supporting and uh, even trying myself to work on infrastructures. I would have two comments or questions. Perhaps this is also going in the latest direction. The first one is that open access is not necessarily always a good thing, particularly in research landscapes in which there's high political control. Uh, a bit of a, the, the, you know, um, being, um, having a, a paywall could be also a safety net so that not everything that is published is immediately accessible. And um, of course, I work on the Middle East and in many Middle Eastern countries. This was for decades. You know, if you publish in English in a scholarly journal that nobody can read, you know, some critique is even acceptable. But if you then publish it on social media or something, then you go, you get in trouble. So this is the first thing. And then the second, of course, is even a, even larger question, but speaking about infrastructures of knowledge, we should also think about what are publications for. And uh, uh, so particularly, so for example, promotion mechanism or to advance knowledge. And uh, I, I, perhaps as a provocation, but uh, I think we're witnessing now with the planet that perhaps we, some sobriety would also be needed. And so perhaps an, an aspect to, to um, have a conversation, a further conversation could be whether we could put some sobriety also in publication practices, not always more and more widespread is, 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 is uh, the, the best. But thank you again, um, really lovely talk. Th thank you, Danielle. I think, I think you raised a really interesting question. I mean, I know um, Vivian, you pointed to COVID as the, as the cause of the spike, but one also has to remember the institutional pressures and expectations on, on academics to publish for promotion or appointments or even graduation in many universities, you have to get two or three 
you know, if to finish your PhD, you have to two or three articles published. That, of course, also generates this sort of sense of more is better. And that, that's a, a bigger conversation that would be useful to have, isn't it? But um, that's perhaps beyond to today's today's brief. And I, I'm, I'm very aware we've run over time. So I'm going to begin to wrap up. Um, I'd really like to thank, thank all three of our presenters for getting up early and managing and reversing lorries and children who need to get to school and, and everything else that comes at the start of the day in the US to, 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 for some great talks. And I'm really hoping we can bring together the threads that you, you, you helped us weave um, and take these conversations forward, hopefully in some form that we can ensure that um, social anthropology benefits from, but also um, the, the larger scholarly debate because you've all got so much to offer. So thank you all again. Um, round of applause to you all and, um, and um, come along to our last IASA webinar, which will be in December on open science, and we'll send you publicity and information about that soon, quite soon as well. Um, thanks all for your time and have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.